All right, welcome to our um, webinar series. My name is Anastasios Papayuanu. I'm Intersect Peer Research Training Manager and the Lead Research Data Scientist. And today's webinar will give an, a good overview of um, how to move from your local PC to cloud or high performance computing. Before we start, um, I would like to introduce um, the two presenters, uh, Gula Mutaza and Israel Casas. So guys, if you can unmute yourselves and present who you are, how is like, what's your involvement with HPC and cloud and like a bit about your background, Gulam. Thanks, thanks Anastasius. Uh, my name is Gulam Murtza. I am eResearch Services Manager at Intersect. Uh, my background is computer science. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. My training is uh, in computer science. I have used uh, HPC and cloud computing environments in my research. In the last five to six years, I have been supporting researchers who are using HPC in their own research workflows. I would not say I am like, you know, a complete expert of HPC systems and <laughs> cloud computing systems, but from uh, more a user perspective, you know, uh, I'll hopefully be able to give a good overview uh, along with Israel, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> sorry for that. Um, Israel, I'm uh, the Bobs here at Intersec. My job, it is to automate all the, ser all the cloud uh, computing services that we provide. My background, uh, it is on computer science. I have a doctorate on cloud computing systems, more specific and uh, more, more specific on schedulers. And uh, well, we're here, here to learn everyone. Thank you. Thanks both. So before we um, start, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are respectively, respectively landed. Uh, for me, are the Camarillo people of the Eora nation. So Intersect is a not-for-profit organization, a uh, member-based organization founded in 2008 by a consortium of New South Wales universities. And currently we, um, we are governed by a consortium of 13 Australian universities, our members, and operates across five states and territories. So our mission is to help researchers to, more, to be more efficient and effective in their research. So to shorten the time to move from an idea to a tested solution. Uh, here are our members, like it's mostly like New South Wales universities, but we have also like presence in uh, Victoria with La Trobe and Deakin, also in uh, South Australia with um, University of Adelaide and um, Capital Territory with, um, with uh, University of Canberra. So we have 13 member universities. Um, the key component of membership services is access to the expert advice, assistance, and support of the services team, comprised of highly uh, experienced and qualified individuals. So they work with uh, researchers to understand the requirements and workflows and assist them to implement advanced digital solutions in their research. Access to this collective uh, expertise of their services team is facilitated usually through the placement of a team member on site within the organization. So membership also provides access to uh, the interesting training program, including training courses at the awareness, like this webinar, introductory, intermediate, uh, and intermediate to advanced levels. Um, our training uh, program is delivered across the membership through the services team and a team of professionals, uh, professional um, training instructors. Since 2013, we have trained over 18,000 researchers in more than uh, 1,400 courses at um, 15 institutions across five states and territories. Uh, in the past few months, um, as part of this webinar series, we have delivered a few other webinars. We started with the, the comparison, the programming comparison. So a comparison between four of the most popular programming languages in uh, academia, Python, R, MATLAB, and Julia. We continued with um, a showcase of data analysis in Python and R, where we had a case study using um, COVID-19 data and we were comparing the two programming languages. And then um, um, last month we had the survey tools in research. So a comparison between two of the most popular um, survey tools like RedCap and Qualtrics. And after this, we're planning also to schedule another uh, webinar which is uh, the thinking like a computer. So talking about the fundamentals of programming. 
Um, you can find our course catalog and when the webinar series uh, on our webpage at learn.intersect.org.au. And there is a landing page also for the webinar series where we're planning to uh, host all our recordings. So at the moment, um, we haven't uh, added um, the recordings of the previous webinars, but we're going to add them shortly. And we're going to add also this webinar there. I'm going to uh, over to you, Gulam, to introduce and talk about the cloud and the HPC computing um, and present the agenda for today's uh, webinar. Thanks. Thanks, Anastasius, for the introduction. Uh, so now I'll start sharing. Okay, let me make it full screen. Okay. Uh, Thanks for joining everyone. Uh, so here is, here is uh, the agenda for today. Uh, we'll start uh, with introducing the problem uh, and then we'll move on to uh, uh, cloud computing and we'll talk a bit about how cloud computing works. Uh, and then we'll talk about common concerns that people might have when they are uh, choosing cloud computing platform. Then we'll move on to high performance computing and we'll see that how high performance computing systems generally work uh, to some extent. And then we'll talk about some of the uh, use cases, uh, some of the uh, components that are involved in making a decision. And we'll see that you know uh, which one uh, would suit better among cloud computing and high performance computing uh, options. And then we'll go on to do a bit of a live demo where we'll run the same code in a, a VM, a virtual machine on a cloud computing environment. And then we'll run it on uh, an HPC cluster, uh, and Israel will lead that one, uh, um, and thankfully. <laughs> um, and and that's that's it for today. So let's start. Let's start right ahead and uh, talk about the problem. So most of us have come across this problem where uh, we uh, are analyzing a data set which is proving to be too big for our local computer or our personal computer, or uh, uh, you know we are analyzing. Uh, large number of data set files where we are running a similar kind of analysis on those data set files and uh, it is taking too long. So either our resources are hogged, we cannot do anything else or it's taking days to analyze our data. And now uh, the question which comes to our mind is whether to uh, offload uh, that uh, data analysis onto a cloud-based uh, uh, environment uh, where we can uh, uh, provision a virtual machine for ourselves or whether to use a high performance computing environment uh, where we can submit our jobs uh, to do our analysis uh, to claim back our computer. Uh, and, and we'll talk about uh, like, you know, what uh, considerations there might be in both of these cases. So let's go ahead and start by introducing what is a cloud computing environment. Uh, so in cloud computing environment, generally you have uh, you know uh, an array of compute servers and uh, storage, uh, and uh, what you do is you provision virtually part of those resources for yourself and claim a virtual machine uh, uh, for yourself. Uh, you can imagine uh, uh, this as uh, infrastructure sitting remote to you, which you access over the internet, and you can imagine this infrastructure divided into small portions and then you virtually claim part of those portions for yourself as virtual machine and then you access that virtual machine over the internet. So that's essentially how uh, you can think of as cloud uh, computing uh, infrastructure. So now I have I've spoken of word virtually and virtualization a couple of times. So let's talk about what is virtualization. So let's consider that this is the data center which is the remote infrastructure which you are uh, claiming virtually, uh, uh, you know, a portion of which you are claiming virtually to be your virtual machine. So how does it work? So for example, if I came along and I want part of this infrastructure uh, as a VM to uh, offload analysis from a local computer to that VM, what I would do is I would, in this case, I, uh, I need two processors and some part of memory 
and I claim it as my own VM. And then Israel comes along and he needs slightly larger uh, VM where he needs three processors and some larger amount of memory. And he, what he can do is he can claim from the same infrastructure of another VM which he works on and offloads his data analysis onto. And now the question which might come into mind is that how does my VM knows that it should not trespass into the memory which is allocated for Israel's VM and uh, similarly for Israel's VM not to trespass onto uh, the infrastructure or the resources of VM1 which is allocated for me. So that is done by a piece of software called hypervisor. So there is a piece of software in uh, the cloud computing systems called hypervisor, which manages the communication between physical hardware and the VMs and makes sure that you know one uh, person's or one researcher's VMs, uh, they do not uh, uh, trespass or uh, onto uh, the VMs which are allocated or uh, claimed by someone else. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about uh, some key characteristics of a cloud computing system. Uh, these uh, five characteristics by no means are exhaustive list. Uh, these are just a few of the characteristics of a, a cloud uh, computing system. First, it should be on-demand self-service uh, system. Uh, so uh, a researcher should not need to submit a request to intermediary and then intermediary uh, allocate resources for uh, uh, the requestee. Uh, a person or researcher should uh, be able to self-provision resources for themselves. Uh, it should provide a broad network access. They should be able to access these resources from anywhere, anytime, uh, from multiple devices, as long as they have access to the uh, internet. It should uh, facilitate resource pooling. So what does that mean? Uh, so if I have claimed or allocated resources for myself, and if I release resources, they should then be uh, uh, put back in as part of uh, a pool of resources which can be used by others to provision resources for themselves. Uh, it should enable rapid elasticity. elasticity. So for example, I uh, provisioned a VM with two processors in the previous uh, slides. If I want to move to 15 processors, uh, I should be able to scale up to 15 or scale back down very easily without, uh, uh, without huge effort. Uh, it should be a major service I should only need to pay uh, for what I'm using in, in most cases. Uh, uh, and uh, there should be transparency around that. Okay, so uh, let's, let's talk about different types of cloud services. Uh, so generally you might have heard uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and uh, software as a service. So let's talk about uh, what, uh, uh, what are these different types and what kind of systems fit into each of these categories. On the screen, the left side, uh, uh, on the left side of the screen are the systems uh, which are less constrained, but they are less automated as well. So that's infrastructure as a service. So uh, in there, we have examples of Nectar Research Cloud or Amazon Web Services, which you can use to uh, spin up a vanilla virtual machine which you have complete control over. So you have super user access onto these virtual machines. However, it is uh, less automated as well. So it is less constrained, constrained. You have complete control over that virtual machine. You can build it up the way you want, but uh, there are no automated services which you can use within that VM as well. Then there is middle ground where uh, uh, you know, uh, initial or, or basic skeleton of an app engine is provided to you. For example, Google app engine uh, based uh, platforms are available to you. You can build on top of those platforms to develop your uh, customized uh, services. And then on the right side is software as a service where uh, they are highly automated, uh, but they are very constrained. They are only mean to do one thing and they do that thing well, but you cannot build anything on top of those. For example, Google Docs and Dropbox and Cloud Store and all those kinds of solutions. Uh, let's now talk about uh, some of the uh, concerns that uh, users or researchers might have when they are moving uh, from their uh, local computer onto uh, a cloud computing environment. So the first uh, concern might be that uh, uh, 
on your local computer, you have a physical access to the computer and that's there with you 24 seven and you can access that at in any time. And you might think that, you know, an infrastructure which is sitting somewhere remote and you are uh, claiming part of it as a virtual machine, would that always be available? And that is a valid concern, but lately in the last 10 uh, or so years, uh, cloud providers have become really sophisticated and uh, the cloud uptime has improved so much so that it's uh, more than 90.99% available. Uh, so uh, it should not be that much of a concern anymore. Privacy and security is, uh, is a real concern, uh, uh, but again, uh, uh, cloud providers, they employ very uh, good privacy and security mechanisms uh, within their services. However, if you are a researcher and uh, you are uh, concerned about privacy and security uh, and sensitivity of your data when you're moving to cloud, you should consider your own use case because in some cases you might have certain regulation you need to, regulations you need to comply with. And those regulations might mean that you cannot move data to certain clouds which uh, does not uh, uh, satisfy your own uh, requirements. Uh, then point number three and point number five, I'll combine them essentially. So portability of tools and data from uh, uh, to and from different cloud platforms uh, could be an issue. Uh, so for example, if there are tools which have complex licensing associated with that, uh, that might uh, be a tricky, uh, it might be tricky to use those tools uh, in, an in a cloud environment. Uh, Lots of cloud environments are trying to work on that where they provide ways to uh, port your license uh, uh, onto their platform easily, or they provide open source alternatives to these proprietary uh, softwares. Um, uncertainty around cost prediction, that is again something which, uh, uh, which is uh, more of an issue for some cloud platforms as compared to others, uh, but uh, the public clouds especially are trying to overcome this by providing a service layer where they are uh, trying to reach or trying to uh, have as much transparency as possible. Okay, so let's now go ahead and talk about high performance computing as compared to uh, a cloud computing where you divide the uh, remote infrastructure into multiple portions and then you claim or allocate uh, provision uh, portions of that uh, infrastructure for yourself and, and uh, work on that portion uh, which is allocated to you as if it's your own computer. High performance computing serves as one big large uh, uh, computer where you submit your jobs and you share that infrastructure with others. So it's not a small window of your own, it's like a large, system which you are sharing with others. And it is made, uh, it is a collection of nodes. Uh, the HPC cluster is a collection of nodes. And this is how it is structured. So HPC cluster has multiple nodes and each node has an array of processors, memory and disk. And uh, uh, furthermore, there are multiple different types of nodes in an HPC cluster. The first type of node we're gonna talk about is a login node. That is the node which you directly interact with when you log into an HPC cluster, you log into the login node. And uh, that is the node which you use uh, to uh, submit your jobs and uh, uh, develop your jobs. Uh, uh, and, and you should not run your analysis and your jobs directly on login node. Uh, because if you do that, uh, you definitely get sla slapped on the wrist by your HPC administrators because that is the node which is shared by all the users to uh, log into the system. In today's live demo, uh, Israel would be running some code on the login node though because, uh, because uh, we do not want you to wait uh, while he submits the job and then we wait for it to run. Uh, but it's a small test job. So, so if you are running a test job, uh, that, that, should be, that should be relatively all right. <laughs> uh, the second node we are talking about is head node. Uh, the head node is the one which takes responsibility of running scheduler. And uh, uh, when you submit a job, 
uh, head node's responsibility is to take care of that queue and fetch the jobs out of that queue and uh, allocate the jobs to compute nodes. And compute nodes are the ones which do the heavy lifting of running the jobs and analyzing your scripts. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, now I have talked some, uh, I, have, I have again uh, used a term called scheduler. Uh, scheduler uh, uh, is the system which takes care of uh, 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 queuing, uh, take, take care of the queues. Uh, so what it does is uh, it runs, of course, on the head node. Uh, so when your job is submitted in the queue, scheduler plucks the job out of the queue and then assigns it to a compute node. Now I'll spend a little bit of time here, right? Because I want to talk about uh, how a scheduler might work. Uh, so based on different types of HPC clusters, schedules, schedulers might uh, work differently. Uh, it's not a simple, uh, first in first out kind of scheduler, uh, the responsibility or the aim of scheduler is to, uh, to optimize the usage of the resources. So uh, uh, for example, if you are uh, requesting large number of cores, then uh, uh, naturally it would take long time or much longer time, uh, wait time for your job to be scheduled. Uh, and uh, if you have a small uh, a job, which requires small amount of resources, then scheduler might prioritize your job first, along with all the other small jobs. Uh, and uh, this is essentially around uh, the policy of fair use and fair sharing of resources. Um, now, when we, when we uh, do so, so we have a training course on getting started on HPC. And when we talk uh, about scheduling and scheduling that course, we talk about some of the uh, tips and tricks where you can, uh, I shouldn't use this word, but work around, uh, uh, find few workarounds uh, for schedulers to uh, schedule your jobs um, uh, with more priority as compared to possibly others. So, what you need to do is you need to work through what is that sweet spot where uh, you would uh, be able to uh, do your analysis much faster as well as not spend too much time in the job queue waiting. So you need to uh, do a bit of trial and error as well as do a bit of like, you know, analysis on uh, how many resources should you request. So if you decide to request few resources, less resources to reduce the queue time, then you can divide your job into multiple or divide your analysis into multiple jobs. And then you can chain those jobs one after another if they are dependent on each other, or you can run them in parallel. But I won't go in any more detail. Uh, we go uh, in slightly more detail in our training courses uh, about how you can you know, work through scheduling. Okay, so uh, let's now talk about uh, some of the key characteristics around uh, high performance computing systems. Uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, in case of cloud computing, these are not, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but I thought that uh, uh, we, we, uh, when we were putting it together, we thought that these might be the most uh, relevant uh, or uh, which were not there in cloud uh, compute case. So the first one is that close to metal. Uh, so over the years, um, the HPC libraries have been optimized to work directly with hardware, uh, uh, directly with, with, with hardware and where uh, it might have to uh, bypass some of, the, uh, some of the layers of some of the software layer, which is directly, very directly needs to interact with OS drivers. And HPC systems are optimized for that. Uh, and that might not be the case in, uh, for uh, cloud computing systems. Uh, user space communication, uh, uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, often many of the user applications, uh, they need to directly communicate with the remote user processes. Uh, and uh, for example, if you are running a job which is running on multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, nodes, and then you need to aggregate results in order to get, uh, 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 in order to uh, 
uh, get the final result, then you need you might need to communicate between user processes, and that communication is optimized in uh, HPC systems uh, uh, in HPC systems as, as compared to uh, uh, cloud compute uh, virtual environments. Uh, again, HPC has, so this also is related to tuned hardware. For example, HPC has tuned high efficient uh, communication memory and uh, uh, processor, uh, processes at, attached to its cluster. So for example, if you consider uh, a use case of uh, weather prediction systems, uh, they definitely use multiple nodes. And if you were using uh, an InfiniBand uh, internode communication as compared to uh, 10 gigabits uh, ethernet, uh, there would be a huge difference in performance of those uh, weather prediction systems. Uh, InfiniBand systems, of course, would perform uh, much better as compared to, uh, as compared to the giganet, uh, uh, gigabit ethernet. And uh, high performance, uh, sorry, HPC uh, storage systems are optimized for high performance and work with these high performance processor and communication uh, 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 communication systems. Another key characteristic of high performance computing systems is batch scheduling. As we discussed that all the jobs are submitted to a job queue and then they're plucked by the uh, scheduler uh, to be run on uh, the compute nodes. Okay, so now what we are going to do is we are going to uh, talk about a few of the use cases and we are going to see that, you know, if uh, it makes sense on cloud or SPC. Just a disclaimer here, when we talk about use cases, these are essentially, uh, uh, these are essentially uh, some of the aspect of uh, a particular overall analysis pipeline. And we are not uh, uh, considering the whole pipeline, we are just, just thinking that if the decision was based on that component, what might make more sense? And in this case, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be rooting for cloud compute <laughs> and Israel will be rooting for HPC uh, systems uh, for each use case and, uh, and, and uh, uh, we try to compete. You know, how about that? Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk about convenience. So what if, we only kept convenience in mind where we are trying to move uh, the analysis from our computer to our, our remote infrastructure. What would make sense if convenience is the only uh, parameter? Uh, you know, I would say that you know, cloud uh, computer systems make much more sense. They are uh, much more prevalent, much more easy to use. I think you, know, you should definitely go for cloud, <laughs> cloud uh, uh, compute infrastructure in this case. For SPC, uh, you can, uh, similar to cloud, uh, you can translate all your workflows, all your script to your local account on SPC, you log in and you execute your jobs, simple as that. But you need some, you need, you, there is a bit of a, uh, not to say that don't use HPC, but there is a bit of a learning overhead, I must say. <laughs> oh yeah, that will work in the jobs. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, if if you if if your uh, uh, you know use case uh, has large memory requirement, uh, uh, definitely uh, you would be able to spin up a VM which which uh, could have large amount of uh, uh, memory, and you should be able to use um, uh, that VM to run a job that was. Uh, larger memory as compared to your own computer and maybe uh, uh, claim back your uh, own computer to run uh, other things uh, uh, locally. So uh, cloud computing make uh, lots of sense. Uh, similarly, HPC uh, offers this important feature as Gulam says, if uh, your workflow, your application needs a lot of RAM, uh, in HPC, you can even get uh, up to one terabyte of RAM and you specify that whenever you submit your job, but you need to keep in this in mind if, as I say, if your application needs a lot of uh, RAM memory. Just like, as a comparison, uh, most of your uh, personal computers must have around 16 gigabytes of uh, RAM. So as I say, HPC can offer a terabyte, which is a, a thousand gigabytes of RAM. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give in on that one. <laughs> that uh, if, if you're using a terabyte of RAM on uh, a VM, it might like, you know, uh, get your cloud bill through the roof. Uh, but yeah, so the next next one we have is uh, uh, the parallel problem solving, uh, and and that is supported on uh, cloud computing uh, VMs as well. So if you have a v, uh, VM which uh, has multiple cores, uh, you can use multiple cores in parallel uh, to uh, make use of that. Similarly, uh, HPC uh, one of the main features of the HPC is to execute parallel programs. Uh, and uh, this is where you can make use of uh, all the nodes, well, plenty of nodes, uh, to execute uh, your, your program. Okay, so if, if your applications uh, are uh, tuned uh, for uh, making use of uh, uh, hardware directly, or you need to directly interact with OS drivers, well, cloud computing might not be a go in this case. And this is obviously a yes in HPC systems where you can um, uh, execute those kind of tasks. And uh, here I can even add uh, one more. Whenever, uh, whenever um, an institution have uh, an HPC, they can uh, obviously storage is one of the main um, important things. So a few, uh, some institutions can even have uh, large storage systems where you need to be uh, close to the metal to have access to those libraries, uh, tape libraries, to, in order to have access to a huge amount of, uh, of, of data. And we're talking about petabytes. Yeah, the next one is uh, if, if you have uh, parallel programs which optimize the, uh, user space communication across nodes. Uh, that is something which, uh, uh, in, in which case cloud computing might not be uh, that efficient. SPC, this is uh, possible. And just as a quick example, let's say that your application, uh, the optimal uh, number of cores is let's say 200 cores. All right, obviously you cannot fit that into a virtual machine. Obviously you cannot fit that easily in a cloud environment. And obviously, physically, you kind of fit that into a single uh, server, a single node, because most of them, they have 60 core, 120 to the max. So the, the shellware will uh, distribute this into a couple of nodes. And between uh, those communication between those nodes are uh, fast. And, for, and hence, uh, this is possible to do, in, to do in an HPC environment. For, as I say, it's a large, large application that requires a lot of number of cores. And the communication between uh, those two servers, those two nodes, um, are, uh, are quite fast. Yeah. Uh, again, this I think is very relevant to the previous one. If it is a multi node job, uh, you know, then, then Basically, if it needs huge number of cores, uh, uh, it may, might not make sense in to use cloud computing. Do you want to add, add anything more on that? Yes, uh, for that on SPC, uh, I mean, I know there is uh, nothing basically that a server. On an SPC environment, whenever uh, they want to add uh, another node, they just add another server, another node, and that is part of the pool of the resources. That's it. Yeah, queuing time. There you go. Uh, finally, something where cl <laughs> come cloud computing makes more sense. So if if you uh, you do not uh, uh, use uh, scenarios where you cannot wait uh, in queue and you uh, uh, want to run uh, some analysis quickly, uh, you might want to consider uh, spinning up a VM in cloud computing environment uh, because in HPC you gotta wait. <laughs> Yeah, th 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 that is correct. Uh, on SPC, uh, you, you need to wait. Uh, you, your job, you submit your job, and that job is put in the, this place into a queue. Uh, so that means uh, that your know, job needs to wait for the resources. As Gulam said previously, if uh, your uh, application needs not many resources, it can get easily placed and being executed. Uh, but in the other uh, hand, if uh, your application needs 200 cores, so then 
then you need to wait until 200 cores are available. And that means that other small jobs are executed faster. So here is where you need to make a balance. And whenever you need the HPC is because you need all that computing power and you can afford to wait for, the, wait for that time. Okay, uh, the next one is virtual networking. So this really is is uh, uh, a little different from our usual, like, you know, uh, use cases we have listed so far, but just we just wanted to make sure that uh, we, we point this out. If, if your organization does not want to uh, support and maintain like, you know, routers and switches, uh, the cloud, uh, there are cloud-based services which provide uh, Virtual routing and uh, switching solutions, which you can use uh, to apply uh, different levels of quality of service, I think, on different uh, workloads uh, that is available through cloud based services. That is not available on HPC. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, sorry, sorry, Israel. Too. <laughs> this is essentially a cloud service. <laughs> uh, yes, so if, if, uh, you are working on uh, an application which requires a strong uh, graphical user interface uh, interaction uh, that uh, uh, would make more sense to uh, use cloud computing VM. So you can use uh, uh, X11 server based, uh, X11 forwarding uh, to, uh, to log into your VM uh, with uh, a graphical user interface and interact with application using gra graphical user interface. You can even uh, use uh, Windows-based virtual machines uh, in cloud computing environment. Uh, so uh, it makes more sense to use uh, cloud option here. Uh, this is not the case for HPC systems. Uh, the, the HPC, they don't have a graphical interface so that means that uh, everything it is through a common line, everything that you say it is by a commands and you basically uh, use only your keyboard and no use of your mouse at all. Uh, the complex licensing. So uh, uh, if, if your application which you're using, uh, they have uh, a complex licensing requirement. So that could mean many things. Uh, but to give you an example that uh, uh, if you have uh, a site-wide license for some software, not all the software uh, licenses right away mean that you can use them in cloud as well. So you might need to come up or uh, go ahead and do uh, separate agreements around that. It could also mean that uh, uh, your cloud provider might, so, so another, sorry, another uh, situation might be that uh, where uh, uh, you cannot easily uh, use uh, your organization has uh, has uh, rights to use the application in whatever way possible, but in some clouds might not have an easy way of accessing the license server of your uh, institution. Uh, so uh, in that case, you might want to choose a cloud provider which provide that uh, license server communication capability. Uh, so in that's why I have put, we have put a, an asterisk there uh, where uh, we, uh, uh, we we recommend that you use the cloud uh, provider which uh, provides the capability of accessing that kind of licensing server in these complex licensing uh, arrangements. Uh, not the case on HPC environments, uh, no complete licensing. Uh, you have access to all the open sources and uh, uh, software and uh, for instance, Python, C, C++, Java, but no all the complex licensing that Gulam mentioned before. But Gadi, Gadi recently, in, uh, sorry, Israel, Gadi did, uh, I think NCI does work with few institutions to help in uh, uh, setting up these license servers and communication between uh, GADI and these license servers. Lately, they have uh, been working with institutions around that. But in general, they also try to provide open source alternatives of all these proprietary systems as much as uh, possible, uh, wherever it is possible. Uh, 
then if if you are using closed again again an unfair thing uh, i think we <laughs> we have put there uh, so if you are using uh, uh, cloud based uh, uh, or database which uh, deployments uh, for example my mysql or you know other uh, database systems uh, which can be easily deployed in cloud and then you can store the result of your analysis and so on into these database systems which are deployed in these cloud environments, uh, the cloud system might be more suitable uh, as compared to HPC systems. Not the case for HPC, uh, basically not for uh, database uh, applications. You can always find a workaround, but HPC is not suitable for that. Uh, uh, interactive programs uh, where uh, your program needs lots of input, uh, interactive input, and uh, you want to see the output, uh, direct immediate output of those uh, 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 analysis programs uh, that uh, uh, would be, uh, I think, very suitable in cloud computer environment where you have complete control of VM and you log into VM as if it is your own uh, computer and you have Need control over. You can interact with uh, uh, the programs which you have you are running or you have uh, installed on that VM uh, in whatever way you want, uh, and uh, it is suitable. Uh, the cloud compute environment is suitable for that. Another case for HPC, there is no interaction with your program. Uh, the only interaction it is you submit your job, and you only see see it at the end the results. The only interaction, if you can want to call it like that, is to cancel your program, yeah, your, your job. That's it. But you can, as Israel said, though, in last uh, point as well, that you can do the workaround. So you can, like, within your job, you can set up, like, you know, hooks and, and all those kinds of things uh, using those workarounds uh, uh, as well. I think we should have put an asterisk there. <laughs> no. uh, uh, the, the custom deployment of like, if you wanna deploy a custom solution to share it with your uh, collaborators uh, uh, within uh, your organization or outside, uh, I think cloud is much better option. Uh, not the case for HPC. Uh, the, uh, it is simple in HPC. It is just to submit your job and get the result. No customizations in, into that. But probably Gulang will add an alter is here and say work around. But <laughs> then again, it used to work around for a small, um, small uh, exceptions. Yeah, hundred percent spot on. So, uh, if if you are uh, if you are if you are uh, thinking that uh, you can uh, increase or achieve a speed up on your uh, uh, analysis uh, and and nothing else nothing else is uh, uh, of consideration there is only one consideration and that is a parallelization so if uh, ram is not a consideration if storage is not a consideration but parallelization is the only way speed up is possible but if your job is not suitable for parallelization you would not achieve any speed up. It would be same as if you are running on your own computer, the, the amount of time it would take uh, in a single thread on your own computer would be the same as, uh, there might be slight change based on what kind of processor is there, but, but virtually would be same uh, on cloud computing as well as HPC, I guess. Yes, yeah, same for HPC, if it's not parallelized, it's not point. <laughs> Uh, so the next one is sensitive data. So again, as we discussed at the privacy and sensitive component of uh, uh, cloud computing environment, it is very uh, uh, specific to your own use case. I would not go through the details again, uh, but you have to make your own call based on your use case. Same for SPC. Uh, you can put everything there as long as it's legal, but it will be up to your requirements. If you can place it or not there. Or if the nodes are in uh, in the Australian state that it needs to be, it's up to your application. Uh, you can conveniently share uh, your data and uh, your uh, uh, virtual machine uh, with uh, 
with your collaborators, with your project members uh, over cloud and cloud systems have become really, uh, cloud providers have become really uh, uh, good in that. Uh, and it's very, uh, this, uh, it's, it's very easy to share uh, resources there. Uh, HPC, it is not mainly for sharing data. Uh, it has a uh, da uh, data start there because if in order to share, uh, it will be if my group of uh, group of people were part of one single project. So everyone has access to a specific folder where everyone share. But then again, uh, in order to get there, all of you should have credentials to log into the HPC system. If you want to make available this for public, uh, not HPC. Uh, okay, so price, uh, I, I think uh, we have put asterisk there. So because uh, it's horses for courses. So uh, in, in some cases it might uh, uh, make sense if price is the, price is the uh, uh, deciding factor. Uh, it might be that in some cases cloud might uh, cost more. In other cases, HPC might cost more. Uh, in some cases, your institution might have access to uh, an HPC time, which is not directly, uh, which is not directly, or the cost is not directly passed on to uh, researchers. In other cases, your uh, organization might have a cloud-based uh, solution, uh, which would have same uh, kind of uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, but and. and in addition, your use case might require certain aspect of things. For example, if your use case requires lots of upload and download of data, uh, your cloud-based providers might charge you to upload and download data into that system. So you might want to reconsider using cloud computer, cloud computing uh, uh, infrastructure for that. Then again, there are waivers and all that for research-based workloads. Uh, but uh, as I said, that is it's dependent on your use case and dependent on the policy of the cloud system which we are looking to use, and uh, also what your organization have, uh, or what kind of arrangements your organization have with cloud or SPC systems. Yeah, SPC, uh, as what I'm saying, it has a cost, but plenty of uh, institutions like uh, universities have access to this pool of resources. So maybe you have access to this, or maybe it has a little bit for cloud or HPC, you can always, for, for plenty of application, you can always use one or the other, depending of what do you have access to. Uh, data transfer. So if, if, you are, uh, if, if your uh, use case is such that uh, it, uh, it requires lots of uh, uh, data storage, um, and uh, uh, you do not want to be limited by the amount of storage that is available next to your compute. Uh, most probably, uh, you should uh, or, or you would be able to uh, get that kind of storage in a cloud compute environment uh, very easily. In SPC, you can, I mean, yeah, you always do data transfers, yeah, yes. Uh, but uh, it is not mainly for uh, doing that the whole time. And one, one important thing he, to mention here, it is wh whether you, uh, you choose cloud or HPC, you need to keep in mind that all your data set will live in that environment. So you will need to do uh, one big transfer. And after that, you will be, uh, I mean, analyzing that data, but you need to keep in mind that your data will live there what you will be taking out will be the results or some other changes. Uh, then again, keep in mind that data transfers, uh, it is more friendly on cloud environment, but not that friendly on HPC systems. Cool, and, and uh, if you think about, I mean, I do not wanna talk about specific uh, 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 we did not, we, we thought that we should not mention specific systems, but uh, again, on the risk of uh, uh, like, you know, mentioning one system, if we create a project on NCI GADI, you get only a specific quota of storage uh, that is available to you uh, for a project. And if you wanna increase that quota, you have to, you know, uh, go through many hoops and you have to apply and, you know, uh, 
So that, on the other hand, in uh, uh, cloud-based system, you can just increase the uh, uh, amount of storage uh, allocated to your uh, uh, allocated to allocated for yourself. Uh, but of course, you need to pay more. Uh, that is some uh, thing that you might want to think. Uh, the next is GPU programming. So if uh, uh, your uh, use case is uh, uh, optimized for uh, usage of GPUs, uh, uh, there are some cloud-based uh, systems which are coming up with GPU-based uh, infrastructure, and you can have GPU uh, spe specialized GPUs, but but they are very expensive one, and there are not many options. Uh, so it might not make uh, the best of sense to use cloud in this case. HPC environments have uh, GPU uh, enabled, so it is possible in HPC systems. Excellent. So we have come to a point where uh, I'll, I'll give it to uh, now uh, uh, Israel to quickly uh, go through and run the uh, uh, same kind of code into uh, a, cl a cloud computed VM and then HPC and compare how it. Uh, compares in terms of time. Okay, so uh, thank you for that. I, I, I will start sharing. I'm not sure if yeah. Uh, give me, okay. So you can see my terminal, is that correct? Yes, Ulan? Yes, yes. Okay, let, let me just quickly say, uh, what, what, what do we have? And then I I'll, I'll, I'll will do this. Uh, and the whole um, explanation will take me uh, five minutes or less. Okay. So on my le uh, on my, the left side, uh, it is a cloud computing environment, and on my right side, it is an HPC environment. Uh, in the cloud, I prepare a virtual machine with sixteen cores and thirty-two gigabytes of RAM. In the both, both environments, I have placed a Python script, and this is a simple one that it does create a two-dimension array, a big one, a 200,000 uh, uh, rows by 100 columns. And what it does, it is simple to uh, uh, take a look on every number and decide if that is uh, between a maximum and a minimum. So I believe that is a repetitive stuff. And I create uh, everything in, in order to specify how many cores do I need to do, a, uh, should I use, okay? Simple, sim simple task. And uh, what I'm trying to do, it is to use uh, many cores in, in each run, okay? So I will try to run at, at the same time. So I call uh, the script and I will, I, first, I, I will run it first for eight cores. So I'll run it here. Let's copy this. Okay. So this should take a, a probably will be around uh, 20 seconds. Uh, I will run it first for eight cores and then I, I will run it for 16 and so on. I will, uh, I will uh, duplicate the number of cores. What I wanted to highlight here is that every time that I increment the number of cores, uh, the execution time uh, goes almost half. Um, I don't, I, don't, I don't want you to put a lot of attention and see that in the uh, HPC environment, uh, you needed 14 seconds to execute where in the in the cloud, it lasts 24 seconds. Don't, don't think just because of this that HPC, it is faster. It is just uh, plenty of parameters. For instance, can be uh, the time of the day, everything that is running, or this is a, a very short application that uses more RAM at the very beginning, and probably the HPC has access to this. I want to um, extrapolate this if in the very case that uh, your applications uh, last a couple of days, then is when uh, this makes, will be similar, similar numbers. So saying this, uh, the ex execution time, uh, it is 24 seconds in a cloud, and 14 seconds in, in the HPC. So I will just duplicate the number of cores. Okay. Now, it's very important to mention that I have prepared a very ideal uh, ideal program, right? This ideal program, it is a simple array where I can 
if I increment the number of cores, I will um, minimize the execution time, okay? Par parallelizing one, uh, one script, it is another job, okay? That, 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 that is the ideal case. And not because you increment the number of cores, that doesn't mean that you will minimize the execution time. Your application must have an optimal number of cores. And this is something that you need to identify. I'm considering that you already know how to parallelize your application and that you know how it is working and that you know how many number of cores you are using. So I'm considering that. And if that is the case, so let's say that I know that my application needs 48 cores to run efficiently, all right? As I said before, in the cloud, in the cloud environment, I don't have, uh, my, my virtual machine has 16 cores. If I say use 32, it won't use 32 because it doesn't have to. In order to use more cores, I need to, uh, I need to resize my, my, my virtual machine and pay for more resources, all right? So it is fast, but I need to do something else. So in the, in the, in the, in the cloud environment, I can only use maximum 16, whether on my HPC environment, I can always use as many as I want to. So in this case, I will use 32 and it will be very fast. And after 32, I'll say, I can, I can use more resources and I, and I can use more resources because I have access to more resources. This, this is the, 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 uh, the, the, the good thing about the HPC that you have access to all of them. Even if you want to use 200 cores, you have access to the number of resources. That, that, that is uh, uh, the objective with this, uh, with this uh, simple uh, uh, program. As I say, it is customized and I already know what I was doing in order to use more cores. That is the end of the explanation. And uh, that's the end of the explanation. Thanks, thanks, Israel. Uh, so, uh, should I share my screen back? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, Israel? Uh, so that I'll, I'll share the slides and uh, we'll conclude. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, just one point we'll make. Uh, so we have shown these uh, uh, scripts and we have looked at the execution times and, and so forth. Uh, we do not by no means, we want to give any uh, 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 definite statement that uh, there would be this kind of linear uh, speed up uh, uh, in your use cases as well. So here, we kind of saw a linear improvement uh, 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 because this particular uh, use case was uh, uh, was uh, was built such that you could see that kind of improvement. But in your use cases, as of, as uh, we were talking in Asasius uh, earlier as well, in your cases, use cases might happen that you increase the number of resources, you get a speed up. And after a certain time, you increase resources and your application starts to uh, slow down. And that most of the time happens because of uh, the amount of communication which might be happening between processes. And that overhead increases so much that overall your application starts to slow down. So we just wanted to make sure that we, we uh, uh, do or disclaim uh, that aspect of uh, uh, the HPC uh, system. And now we'll, we'll just conclude at the end uh, and uh, we'll uh, uh, just uh, point, we'll just, we'll just uh, point out that uh, based on our discussion so far, what we have, uh, what we have seen is that uh, you might be able to use cloud computing resources for some use cases and HPC for the others or combination of the resources uh, for, uh, uh, combination of the resources for a few of the use cases uh, might be best. What do you say, Israel? Uh, is that a fair point? <laughs> no, I, I totally agree in uh, everything that you say. I'm, I'm preparing my responses for uh, for the questions that are there already. Okay, cool. So you you take care of the chat, and I'll conclude the uh, I'll conclude the uh, uh, presentation. So. Uh, 
and and thanks for agreeing to me on everything. It might be a dangerous thing though. So, <laughs> so uh, as as we just mentioned, that more CPUs do, don't uh, always necessarily mean faster uh, application and faster analysis. So uh, you have to find that. Uh, 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 sweet spot uh, where uh, you uh, uh, where, where you find a speed up uh, by uh, getting more resources, uh, but uh, you might see that if you increase any more resources, it, there is uh, uh, a bit uh, too much of uh, an overhead. Um, uh, you again, the second next point is also related to that. You should uh, optimize the combination of I/O and compute time. Uh, that is needed for your systems, uh, sorry, for your uh, particular uh, uh, data analysis. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So uh, as I said, that uh, uh, you should divide your job into smaller if you are requiring too many resources, uh, because you might spend too much time in, in, uh, in queue. So in that case, you might wanna divide your job into multiple uh, sub jobs or multiple smaller jobs. But then again, you need to make sure that you optimize uh, that how much time each sub job or smaller job would need in IO. And if that IO is increasing too much, uh, you might tip over that balance. So you might, you, you want to find or optimize uh, the time that you need for IO in all those jobs as compared to the time you wish need uh, or you would spend in uh, actually using the compute. Uh, before uh, you start, uh, always, always uh, uh, find the optimized number of cores, as we said, by, uh, by uh, doing the test runs on uh, smaller jobs. So uh, use lots of the HPC systems and HPC clusters have the uh, test queues, which have uh, much smaller queuing time. So always start small and try to find the optimized uh, parameters and uh, 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 and then move on to the big jobs. Uh, scheduler optimization is a topic in itself, a big topic. And uh, we, we cover some of that in our training courses uh, related to HPC. Uh, and uh, uh, have a look that when a next training course in your, uni uh, course in your university is coming, we also uh, offer training courses at uh, non-member universities now as well. Please get in touch. Uh, at uh, training at intersect.org.au uh, and we would get back to you. That's it. Uh, over to you, Anastasios, if you want to add anything. No, thanks. Thank you very much, Gulam and Israel. And uh, as a heavy user of HPC during my PhD, um, I have to say that the most trickier, the trickiest part is to always remember that part of the execution is also the scheduler time. So you need to find the time that even by reducing some cores, if you're losing some speed, but having it run super fast, it, it's also different. So it's a combination of these two, like all the time. So um, um, I'm gonna, there are a lot of questions. So please um, uh, send your questions through the Q and A or through the chat. And I'm gonna start asking Israel and um, Gulam. So there is the first question talking about like, what about running an HPC cluster in the cloud? You can get the benefit of both an HPC environment and cloud scalability, flexibility, no. So is that feasible? Yeah, so I, I put that message in chat there as well that uh, you're right. Uh, there are lots of public clouds which are getting into the game of providing HPC cluster. We did not talk about any specific ones for two reasons. One, we do not know the details of all of them anyway. And second, if we, it could have been a rabbit hole uh, of going into and comparing the different uh, cloud, uh, sorry, HPC, uh, public cloud HPC providers. But anyways, going back, uh, yes, lots of public cloud providers are providing HPC cluster, HPC uh, based applications, but I think there would be a long way before they could match the specialization, specialized services which have been built by uh, the Grant funding, grant funded uh, uh, HPC providers like NCI because they have developed all of these application suite and uh, this wealth of knowledge uh, and wealth of uh, uh, optimization of their HPC systems around specific applications. 
uh, and in addition uh, uh, in addition uh, the high speed interconnect that is needed within a node between processes as well as internode uh, that has been developed uh, uh, that has been developed for uh, uh, these grant funded hpc systems would not public cloud system would not be able to get the economies of scale in order to do that investment because this is huge investment and in order to uh, uh, you know uh, in order to uh, do that investment with confidence you need to have confidence that you know you would be able to achieve economies of scale and i i'm not too sure if we are uh, we are there yet but as i said that you know i have heard you know don't don't take my word on it, word for it like two articles here and there that Microsoft Azure might be providing the best, <laughs> best of all uh, public cloud provider might be providing the best uh, interconnect uh, based uh, HPC service uh, among them all. What do you What do you say, Israel? Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, I know that uh, different providers can uh, you can build uh, a small HPC cluster in, within that, but let's uh, keep in mind that the HPC physically. Physically, it has all those uh, uh, infrastructure. It is specialized in order to make fast those connections. It is not something uh, virtual. Okay, so if uh, if that can be built in, in a cloud, it means uh, building building an SPC cl cluster. It is virtually that they're the building, and the, it will be fast. But I don't. Uh, I know that. Uh, most of the providers, uh, they don't have enough clients in order to make that huge investment in order to have a proper HPC. That is my uh, the way I see it. Thank you okay. both. Um, we have another question. Um, and a person is asking if it's possible to run Postgres SQL in HPC. Okay, for that, uh, every HPC environment has their own available uh, uh, software. So I will need to take a look on, uh, for instance, in Gary, if that is available. So I will take, if I can take that question offline. Yep, definitely. There is another question also, um, talking about like, how does HPC and cloud computing compare to techniques on workstations like Apache Spark or Open GPU data science processing like rabbits.ai? Will these two options vastly improve processing? Uh, okay, so Two things. One, I have never used these uh, applications, uh, but I can generally uh, comment on that. That uh, uh, from the look of it, it uh, seems that you might be able to use these. So, if this is an application which cannot be installed in user space, it would be hard. Uh, to get it up and running in uh, HPC clusters, which are nationally shared ones. Uh, uh, but uh, from looks of it, uh, I'm not sure, too sure, Ralph, but it seems that you might be able to uh, take benefit from GPU-based uh, GPU clusters, and it might improve uh, the processing time if you use GPU queues uh, in HPC clusters uh, for these applications, but again, I, I would not, I would not have uh, in-depth knowledge of these applications and how they would perform uh, for their specific use case in HPC environment. Uh, yeah. Israel, do you wanna? Yeah, what, what, what we can uh, mention here it is that uh, most of HPC environments are GPU enabled, and then you can uh, run, uh, make use of, of them, but. Uh, the the user more to give a go to this. That's it. All right. Um, we are all, already over time, and I don't see any more questions. So I'm gonna give another minute to people if they would like to add any other questions to for Gulam and Israel. Otherwise, we can um, we can finalize the webinar here. 
Thanks, Ismail. So as we said, all the recordings will be available on our website. Um, we're planning to start making the first ones available shortly. Uh, and then like we're gonna add all the recordings in um, on the website where you can go and check um, what was covered today in the previous uh, webinars. All right. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar and hopefully we can see you in the next one, which is again the uh, fundamentals of programming. If you're interested or um, feel free to share with people who may be interested actually about the programming or any programming fundamentals or people who are willing to uh, learn programming what they don't know, like um, if it's useful, how they can use it and what's behind the scenes actually. Um, so thank you very much, Gula, and as well for this uh, great presentation and for um, hearing a few things about like uh, cloud and uh, HPC and how we can make a distinction between the two uh, different systems. Gula, yes. Sorry, I had a comment about that Postgres SQL question. Uh, I forgot totally. <laughs> yes, you can run that uh, Postgres SQL and any the light databases kind of like, you know, which uh, so you can run them, but how would you optimally use in HPC systems? Sorry, we have been saying that a lot, but it is dependent on your your uh, specific use case and uh, the HPC cluster which we are using, how they interact, uh, all three of them, how they interact with each other. Great, thanks Gula. And thanks everyone for attending. Have a nice week ahead. Thanks Gula, thanks you all. Well.